All right, amen. Second Thessalonians chapter number two. Look at verse number seven. Look at verse number seven. It says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The title of the sermon this evening is The Mystery of Iniquity. The Mystery of Iniquity. We're going to talk about that today. Obviously, if you study this out, you'll see that it has two sides. It's got a religious aspect to it and a political one. We're just going to focus on the religious side of that today. Now, keep your place there because we will come back to explain all this. Uh, but go to 1 Timothy chapter number 3. 1 Timothy chapter number 3. And so we're told in this chapter not to let any man deceive us. And Paul's constantly saying, hey, don't be ignorant of the last days. Don't let people deceive you when it comes to prophecy and these sorts of things. So, you know, these doctrines and these topics are very, very important for us to understand. We need to know what's going on. We need to, un you know have this at the forefront of our minds, especially in the day and age in which we live, because there is a lot of false teaching out there when it comes to prophecy. There's a lot of false teachers out there when it comes to a lot of things, to be honest with you. And it does take its toll on our community. And so we need to have the answers. Now, before we get into the mystery of iniquity, we're going to look at the mystery of godliness, because there's more information on that, obviously, than there is in the mystery of iniquity. And so let's start with that here. Look at verse number 14. So 1 Timothy chapter 3, very famous chapter. Uh, we talk about this chapter all the time when we're dealing with the qualifications of a bishop or a deacon. And so right after Paul gives Timothy these qualifications, in verse 14, he says this. He says, these things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, what does that mean there? Well, keep in mind, what does the word church mean? It means congregation. That's right. It means congregation. Church is a congregation. It is supposed to be a congregation of believers, people that believe on Christ. Now, does that mean that unsaved people can't come in? Of course not. We want all kinds of people to come in here in hopes that we might get them saved and discipled and so on and so forth. But Paul is telling Timothy, hey, there's a certain way that you need to behave in the house of God amongst the brethren. And that's why he gave him that list of qualifications. That's why he told him how to behave himself in the house of God. Look at verse 16, it says this, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Now go to Ephesians chapter number three. Now in that last verse there, in verse number 16, it says preached unto the Gentiles. Okay, now does that mean it wasn't preached unto the Jews of that time? No, of course not. It was preached unto them as well. But there's a reason why that is phrased that way. And that's what we're going to take a look at because there's a mystery surrounding that phrase, which Paul obviously will tell us. Now, in verse 16 there that we just read, it says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And then he goes on to just give a very short summary of God's nature. Right? We have to understand this, and we do understand this in this church, that Jesus Christ is fully man fully God, okay? Because what's becoming more and more popular today is this idea, well, no, Jesus was just um, God's son, okay? And so that's just like the human part, and then the God part, you know, is after he died and resurrected. And there's all kinds of weird ways that people twist that and teach that. I think Manly Perry kind of heads down that road, if I'm not mistaken, and that's false doctrine, okay? And you're going to see things like that increase as we get closer to the end. And you ask why? Well, because in order for the mystery of iniquity to really work and to come to its full fruition, a separation between the Word of God and the Word of God has to happen. Okay, this is why you will see people fall away. And we'll get into that more here in a moment. The very next chapter, you don't have to turn there. It says this same thought. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And we've spent time this last few weeks talking about that. And so I don't want to revisit that, but, you know, he gives him the truth, right? Paul gives Timothy the truth. He says, hey, here's a short summary of the nature of God and says, hey, in the last times you need to remember this is very important that this teaching is going to be uh, just twisted, pulled apart, blasphemed in every way possible. And that's exactly what we're starting to see today. Ephesians chapter 3, look at verse number 1. It says this, 
For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words. So hopefully by reading just these few verses, you can understand that a mystery in the Bible is something that has to be revealed to us by God. Okay, and, and keep, please keep in mind, I think we all get this here, we all understand this. No one today gets any private interpretation. Right. No one's at home praying in their closet and hears an audible voice from God saying, hey, I need you to go do X, Y, and Z, or this actually means this, or here's a private scripture for you, go tell it to your church, okay? And you say, oh, you're crazy. Well, this happens every day in churches all throughout the world, okay? Where somebody gets up in front of a congregation and says, God told me X, Y, and Z. God told me to tell you this. God told me to say this. And that's nowhere to be found anywhere in the Bible. Okay. Look at verse number four. He says, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Okay. So this is something that Paul wants us to be able to explain. He wants us to understand that. Now, how do we get that understanding? Well, you get it by reading the Word of God. You get it by reading His teachings and what He told us. Look at verse 5. It says, "...which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto His holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit." So what he's saying there is he's saying, you know, in times past, specifically in the Old Testament times, this wasn't widely known. The prophets spoke, but they didn't quite fully understand what they were saying. They didn't know how this was all going to unfold. And you're probably like, what in the world is he talking about? Well, let's keep reading. Look at verse number six. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Now, this is still a mystery to a lot of people today. I've had pastors stand up, you know, I've gone to churches, and this is kind of a shame, and I've mentioned this before, where they've taught things like, you know what, in the millennium, we're going to serve Jews. They will do their sacrifices, they will be in their temple, they will be God's people, and you will be basically sweeping up underneath them, okay? You say you're crazy. No, that is being taught all over the place. Okay, that's racist. That, that, is, that is false doctrine. You know, and you say, well, what does all that mean? It means it's, a, it's still a mystery to people. Why is it a mystery? Because they don't read the Word of God. They don't believe these things oftentimes, okay? Or they're just mixed up, okay? But what does he say there? That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, not sub-heirs, not below heirs, okay? Fellow heirs. And of the same what? The same body. You see, back in these times here, even back in the days that the Ephesians were around and their church was thriving and growing, you know, there were a lot of questions that came up. And people were like, you know, well, how does this all work? What's going to happen with Israel? What's going to happen with Judea? What's, what's, what's going on here? Are they gone forever? You know, what's the deal here? And Paul's revealing to them the mystery. Well, guess what? The Israel of God is made up of believers. In Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither male nor female. I had a pastor attack me one time. This is a couple years ago. I said, I don't like what you said. I don't like the fact that you said that. I'm like, what? The fact that I read Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6? He was like, yeah. And I don't like what you said about, you know, the Jews aren't going to be above Christians, you know, in, in, the, in the end times and, you know, in, in the millennium and in the new world to come. <laughs> You're out of your mind, independent fundamental Baptist. You are crazy to even say something like that. Right. That is ridiculous. Right. There's, and you know what he said? This is, that's right. This is what he said. He says, yeah, well, also says there's neither male nor female. So explain that. What are we talking about? Let's back up for a second. What does it mean that in Christ there's neither Jew nor Gentile? Right. We're all saved. <laughs> We're all of one blood. We're all of, you know, the blood of Christ, if you will. We're all equal in Christ. Fellow heirs, right? We're not, you don't have to join a country to be the child of God. That's what that means. So we're talking about position, your position in the body of Christ. So when he says neither male nor female, well, guess what? What's the position of a male now in the household? It's the leader. It's over the female. It won't be like that in heaven. It won't be like that when this is all done away with. That's what that means. You see, but these people can't think about these things. And why is that? Because it's a mystery. Because they don't care to know. They heard something in their college. They read something in a book. It appealed to their flesh. They said, this sounds great. I'm just going to go with this. Look at verse number seven. 
whereof I was made a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of His power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Okay, and this is where people get derailed. We talked about this last week. You know, Sam Gipp and a lot of dispensationists, you know, and it's not even just them. Right. I've, I've, uh, I've looked this up. There are quote unquote new evangelical types that will say stuff like this. Well, Paul's the apostle to the Gentiles. So if you weren't born in the Holy Land, then you really, you know, whatever Paul says supersedes anything else in the Bible. And we proved last week beyond any shadow of a doubt that even John, Peter, all these guys, not only did they preach to Gentiles, but they were also post-trib pre-wrath. OK, very simple to understand. So let's move on from that. Look at verse nine it says this. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So we are supposed to understand what is this fellowship? What is this mystery here? Well, it's the fact that we're fellow heirs. Okay? No one's special over the other. If you're saved, you're in Christ. That's your position. And you just got to be good with it. But you do need to explain this to people because God's desire is that men would know this. Look at verse 10. He says, To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. So again, okay, what does the Bible say uh, about the Jew in the Old Testament? It says that the oracles of God were given unto them. Okay, So if you were, let's just hop back to the days of Ahab and Jehoshaphat in the southern kingdom of Judah, okay? Who had the oracles of God? Yeah, Jehoshaphat, the people of Judah. Remember when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, took over the northern kingdom of Israel, what did he do? He told the Levitical priests, hey, I'm going to make the lowest people of the land priests. I'm going to set up two calves, one in Bethel, one in Dan. Hopefully I got that right. And uh, just basically start my own religion. Just start things the way that I want to run them. That way I won't lose the people. And so now if you wanted to get truth, what did you have to do? If you wanted to go to the temple and you wanted to serve God, well, now you had to go down to the southern kingdom of Judah. And that tradition carried on until the time of Christ. The veil was torn in two, torn in half. And now we are under the new covenant. Okay. This is an important doctrine. People say, why do you always go off on this? Because we're told to go off on this. It's a mystery. It's something that needs to be explained to people. Look, you don't just get saved and automatically understand this stuff. It's, you know, it requires study and it requires thought. Okay. Look at verse 11. It says, according to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Go to Romans chapter number 11. Romans chapter number 11. So again, mystery, something that has to be revealed to us by God. Romans chapter 11, continuing off of that same thought there, the mystery that the Gentiles would be fellow heirs with Jews, with everyone else in Christ in the same body. Look at verse number 25. It says this, Romans eleven twenty-five. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Do you see that there? We should not be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. And that's exactly what happens. If you don't believe me, go read a commentary by Peter Rockman, and you will see very quickly what I'm talking about. Lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Look at verse 26. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Now, is that what Jesus did when he came back or when he came here the first time? How did he turn ungodliness away from Judea? By preaching the word the word of God by preaching them uh, the kingdom of God and how to be saved. Right. I mean, think about this. What was a mystery to Nicodemus? Born Being born again, the gospel. Right. Exactly. Now uh, you can leave your place there, but go to Isaiah chapter 59, Isaiah chapter 59, because in order to really get a good, deep understanding of those two verses, it's often helpful to just go back to where it was written, what Paul's quoting from so that we can pull some more, uh, insight from that. And so Paul makes this statement about this mystery. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. Well, let's, let's step back for a second. Okay. What makes up Israel? What makes up that nation? 
It's 12 distinct tribes, right? We talked about this uh, several, several weeks ago. Remember when I drew that little diagram with the standards and the little flags and, and so on and so forth, right? That is what make up the, uh, the physical nation of Israel were 12 distinct tribes. What happened after King Hosea got conquered by the Assyrians? Those 10 tribes went away. Where are they at today? They're gone. Right, they're gone. And so you are left with the tribe of Judah, Benjamin, and then obviously Levites and stragglers who came in after that, okay? So is Israel today in the Middle East made up of 12 distinct tribes? No, it's not. Okay, look at verse number 20, Isaiah chapter 59, look at verse number 20. This all part of this mystery here. Look at verse 20, he says this, And the Redeemer shall come to Zion. Well, who is that? Well, that's Jesus Christ, right? This is a prophecy. Remember, Paul talked about this. He said, and the Redeemer shall come to Zion, obviously to Jerusalem, to Judea, to the Holy Land, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. Well, I mean, think about it. When Jesus came, did everybody believe on him? No, a lot of people rejected him. A lot of scribes, a lot of Pharisees rejected him. The whole organization of Sadducees rejected him. Right? They rejected the word of God as a whole. Anyways, look at verse 21. He says, as for me, this is my covenant with them. Who's the them? Back up to verse 20. And unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. Is that to the people that turn from their sins? No, that's for people who did the will of God, John 6, 40, and put their trust and their faith on Christ and became born again, got saved. Okay, so he says, as for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee and my words, which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seeds, seed, saith the Lord from henceforth and forever. Now you can leave your place there and go back to second Thessalonians chapter number two. And so then Paul says in Romans eleven twenty seven, 27, you have to turn there. He says, for this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. So when he says, and all Israel shall be saved, people say, well, that's a mystery. How does that work out? Well, because you have to be saved to get into the Israel of God. Okay. That's what he's talking about there. The mystery of godliness that we as outsiders to that physical nation that was once a thing on this earth, that we would be fellow heirs positionally placed in Christ, that we could have fellowship like we talked about on Sunday night with Christ. That is a mystery. It's a mystery to the world. It's a mystery even to people who are just saved. These are things that you have to learn, okay? So real quickly, let's just summarize here the mystery of godliness, okay? Obviously, whosoever believeth and is saved is placed into the Israel of God. Okay? That is a mystery. That is a mystery of godliness that we who just get saved could have fellowship with Christ, increase godliness, have our feet washed like we talked about on Sunday night. And what does it center around? It centers around the working of Christ. Okay? The mystery of godliness centers around the working of Christ. And I'm repeating this for a good reason. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, look at verse number 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Okay, so the flip side, the opposite of the mystery of godliness, the mystery of iniquity, it doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And we're going to back up for a second here. See, Genesis chapter three, what do we realize about seed? Well, God has his seed. Okay, the devil has his seed. And then you have the masses which are in between, which haven't made up their minds one way or the other. Are they going to follow Christ or are they going to follow the devil? Okay, so with that in mind, that is what the mystery of iniquity is ultimately geared towards. To set the world up in a position to where masses of people would go over to the devil's side. That they would want to make him their savior. And this is what Satan is doing. He is working towards his mystery, which is iniquity. Iniquity is wicked sin. That is what the Bible teaches. Let's back up here and look at verse number one. Because in order to break down verse number seven, we need to take a look at the whole context. Because what a lot of people will do is they'll say, well, that's the Holy Spirit. Okay, well, let's see. We just read the chapter before the service. Is the Holy Spirit even mentioned in this chapter? Well, let's take a look. I mean, before verse seven. Let's look at verse number one. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by, their, by our gathering 
together unto him. Verse 2, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. Again, we talked about this last week. We're not supposed to be troubled that, you know, the day of Christ could happen at any moment. It could be tomorrow. There are certain things that need to take place in order for that to happen, like the revealing of the Antichrist. Look at verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Okay. Now, this falling away is not complete, but what's happening is this mystery of iniquity is in the works. There are things being done to drive people like us who believe in the mystery of godliness out of the public eye. They want us off social media. They want us uh, obviously off TV. They want us away from people as much as possible because we are influential. When we go out and preach the word of God, this is a sword. It affects people and they know this and that is why they're trying to stop us. Now keep your place there in 2 uh, Thessalonians 2. Go to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter number 8. Because I just want to give you a couple of verses, just two verses to show people when they say, well, the falling away, that's the rapture. Okay. The problem is, that's just false. Okay? Um, what, what did Paul say in Corinthians? Well, how did he describe the rapture? That we'll all be changed, we'll be caught up together, like in, in the twinkling of an eye. Okay? It's just going to happen very, very quickly. It's not a falling up. People don't fall up. Okay? But this is a verse that these pre-trib guys will use oftentimes to say, see, that falling away in the Greek means caught away. It means to be caught up with Christ. Okay? No, it doesn't. That is a lie that is not true. Luke chapter 8, look at verse number 13. Jesus is giving the parable here. Uh, he says this, They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. Now, is this a falling up? They just individually, you know, they, they can't play ball anymore. So Jesus is like, let's just rapture them up. Let's just secretly rapture these guys up because they're just not behaving. Time to come home. Okay, No, that's not what he's saying, right? The, they don't lose their salvation. But we, look, we've seen this in this church. You've seen this in all kinds of churches, right? Where people just, they just, you know, they, they get saved. They continue for a little while. And then, you know, trials, tribulations, temptations, different things come up and they're out. Okay, it's a part of life. It's what we have to deal with. Now go to 2 Timothy chapter number one, and I'll show you one more. 2 Timothy chapter number one. So again, same language there. Fall away. A departure from the truth. A departure from serving God. Okay, that is what is going on here. 2 Timothy chapter one. Look at verse number 15. And look at what Paul says here. He drops two names of people who actually fall away from him. 2 Timothy 1.15 says this, This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. Now, did they go up? Did they get raptured because they decided they didn't want to be fellowshipping with Paul the prisoner? Okay, and Paul spends time talking in this chapter here. Hey, don't be ashamed of my chain. Don't be ashamed of, you know, this bondage that I'm in and all this sort of stuff. Here, you know, keep encouraging, keep going forward. And then he just mentions a group of people in Asia that fall away. Now, does that mean that they're not saved? No. Why did John write, you know, Revelation and, you know, the letter to the seven churches? If everybody in there was not saved or if they all got raptured up. It doesn't make any sense. It's obvious what it's talking about here. This thou knowest that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. And then he mentions two people of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. Okay. Now are the, we, you know, this is the only time in the Bible that these two names are mentioned. So we don't know a whole lot about them. But if I were to wager, I would bet that they were probably saved people who basically were examples of Luke chapter eight, verse 13 who heard the word, were excited, served God for a little while. Obviously, temptation came up, and they dipped. They turned away from Paul. They departed from the truth. Go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, and let's read verse number 3 again. So Paul says, let no man deceive you. What does let mean? Allow, right. He's, he's saying, hey, don't allow somebody to hoodwink you. Don't allow people to trick you with their false doctrine. Let no man deceive you by any means. And look, there are a lot of means. There are a lot of ways and teachings and channels and books out there that are doing exactly this. 
He says, for that day shall not come. Okay, that day. What day? The day of the Lord shall not come, except there come a falling away first. That is an apostasy. That is a departure from the truth. That is a, um, a Luke 8, 13, a, a 2 Timothy chapter 1, what we just read. You're going to see that on a large scale. And we're already seeing it. We've been seeing it for many years. You go out there and you get people saved and you never see them again, right? Or when you do, they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm saved. You know, you talked to me last year. I'm already saved. And it's like, praise God, but come on, man. Can't you just come to church? Can't you read your Bible and just do something for God? No, because they don't want to. They're caught up in the ways of the world. Look at verse, um, look at the rest of the verse. It says, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So people will teach this all the time. And you guys have all heard this, you know. It's good to know about the Antichrist, but we shouldn't spend too much time on it because we're not going to be here when he's revealed. We're not going to be here when he comes on the scene. What does it say here? <laughs> we'll be out of here. That horn's going to blow and we're gone. We're going up. I've heard preachers say, I don't care. You could stay for the tribulation. I'm going up. <laughs> okay. Okay. The problem with that, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except something happen first. And what is that something? A falling away and the man of sin be revealed. And who is that? The son of perdition. Okay. The son of perdition. That's, that phrase is used one other time in the Bible to describe somebody. Who is that? That's Judas. That's right. Look at verse number four. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So for context right now, who are we talking about? talking about the Antichrist. Verse 3, verse 4. We're going to come back to that. But I'm going to take a little bit of a break here and have you go to Matthew chapter number 7. Matthew chapter number 7. Because I don't want to get too far off in talking about the Antichrist tonight. We're working on the mystery of iniquity. What could that be? What's the goal? What does that even look like today in our modern society here? Well, very interesting here in Matthew chapter number seven. We've read these verses several times. Look at verse number 21. It says, not everyone, this is Jesus speaking here. He says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Again, what is his will? That we would believe on Christ. Verse 22, many. Does it say a few? Does many mean a few? No, it says many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works. Very interesting here that at the great white throne judgment, there are many people and many means most. And what are these people saying? We have prophesied in your name. Yeah. That means we taught in your name. So that means that this religious system here that we're getting a picture of has to be alive and well today and has to even go off into the time of the Antichrist, right? Prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils. Now there's a group of people out there that claim to do this and we had a run with them on Saturday. Okay, the Pentecostals, the good old signs and wonders movement, the charismatic movement. What else does it say? And in thy name done many wonderful works. I was watching a little video by Kenneth Copeland that I think Chuck James sent this to me. And um, <laughs> I don't think it was the rap one, but he, he, it was Kenneth Copeland, right? And he's doing his, his usual, you know, running around without a Bible and stuff. And... He's basically commanding spirits. He's like, I command this spirit to leave, you know, my state and this and that. And he's like, I command the coronavirus to leave here. And I command that the scientists come up with a magical cocktail, also known as a vaccine, that will cure people. And I was looking through the comments and I saw one that said, man, these, this is a church. That's a brother that's doing a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, think about it. You're a Pentecostal who claim you can heal people, resurrect people, do all of these crazy things. 
and you stand up before your congregation and pray for an ungodly, disgusting, metal-filled vial full of who knows what kind of chemicals. To save people? Why don't you just do it? Copy? Because you're a fraud. Because he's a devil. And because that whole movement, their whole goal is to separate the Word of God, Jesus Christ, from the Word of God, from the Bible. That's the goal. Because when you do that, what are you left with? Looking for signs and wonders. So this charismatic movement literally is working iniquity, and they are paving the way for people to believe on the Antichrist. And you got idiots like John MacArthur. Um, he's a Calvinist guy. You've got uh, another guy named Andrew Sluter and Bill Grady, these other uh, Baptist dispensationalists, Sam Gipps, saying that you can take the mark of the beast and then possibly do the baptism of John and get it all washed away. Or you could just cut your head off or cut your hand off and still be saved and go to heaven. Okay? <laughs> That's where we're going. That's where they're going, okay? That, that, let me say that. That's where Christianity so-called today is going. That's the direction that they're heading. When the Antichrist is out and about doing his thing, taking power, changing times, changing seasons, you know what you're going to have? You're going to have these same idiots like Copeland or whoever, the Apostle Catherine Crick, Catherine Kirk, Captain Kirk, whatever her name is that uh, we talked about in one of our tongues videos, you're going to have them taking the mark. And you know what? They're not going to be like, oh, I, yeah, I took the mark of the beast. No, it's not even going to be called that. Do you think that Walgreens is going to be like, hey, come down here and take the mark of the beast? No, man, it's going to be called something else. It's not going to be that simple. Right? You need some wisdom to discern this thing. That's why we're supposed to understand these mysteries and these things that are going on in the Bible. Okay, but you will see those congregations take that mark, whatever it is. It's not the mark of the beast. In the original languages, that doesn't really mean that. You know, that's why I harp on that so much, because that doctrine will play a huge role in not only our day, but in the days to come. Because the goal is to separate the Word of God, Jesus Christ, from the written Word. And you can't do that. You can't have fellowship with Christ if you're doing that. Anytime you get up and somebody says back in the original languages or in the Greek, which, by the way, typically only happens in English-speaking countries, you're not going to go to Greece and say something like that because they're going to mock you and they're going to laugh at you. So again, verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast, uh, cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works. Look at verse 23. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You see that there? The mystery of iniquity. What is it? Well, it's a lot of things, and I don't think we're ever going to, until Christ comes back, we're not going to have the, the perfect picture. But here we can see a group of people that are working iniquity. And what did Paul say? What did John say? Both of them said this, that it's already, the mystery of iniquity already works. It's already working, okay? And that mystery is a push to get people to believe in the signs and wonders. Because you have to think about this, you know, even the, the, uh, the Muslim, the Buddhist, you know, all these religions, they're going to look at the Antichrist and be like, this is the guy, you know, and they're going to all come together. Hey, signs and wonders is what is what it's about. You know, if you believe in the Bible, so-called, you know, so be it. This is, you know, Christ means Messiah. This guy's obviously a savior. We just had a few things wrong. And, you know, if you really go back to the original languages, it makes sense now, right? Signs and wonders, signs and wonders. That is what this thing is all about. The mystery of iniquity, right? So so-called Christians, you know, they profess Christ. They profess power. But what do they do? They remove Christ from from the Word of God. And all of those people teach work salvation. They teach that you have to be good. You don't think the Antichrist is going to end towards that? we got to trust in humanity and take the holy chip. You know, I, I don't know, but something of that nature. Now go to Genesis chapter number 15. And obviously, you know, in Matthew 24, we're, we're going to come to that chapter here in a little while. But Jesus said, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And isn't that what we see today? Right? The Bible is very clear. Jesus told us working iniquity is claiming that you have Christ without the word of God. You have the wrong gospel. You have the wrong message of salvation. He says you work iniquity. 
You claim you went around and taught in my name and you've done all these works and you cast out demons and you had all these signs and wonders, but the reality is you're working iniquity like a job. That's what he's saying to them. Now, what I want to do now is just give you an illustration of the working of iniquity because we can see this actually in Abraham's life. In Genesis chapter number 15, um, uh, uh, well, let's just start reading here. Look at verse 14. So it says this in verse 14. It says, And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. Okay? So God is telling Abraham what's about to happen. You guys are going to go into Egypt. You know, things are going to happen. It's going to be 400 years of hard labor and bondage. But then afterward, you're going to come out, and you're going to be way better off than when you went in. Verse 15, And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. Verse 16, But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet. Very interesting when you study this out here. Why does he say that? The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Well, go back to chapter 14 real quick. Look at number 13. Insight onto where Abraham's at and kind of who he's dealing with here. Verse 13, Genesis 14, 13 says this. Says, there came one that had escaped and told Abram. So we've talked about this recently, right? This is when Lot gets taken captive because he's living with the Sodomites. Verse 13, and there came one that escaped and told Abram, the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eskel and brother of Aner. And these were confederate with Abraham. Okay, so at this time in Abram's life, he, you know, he's got Amorites and he's living in the land of Canaan and he's dealing with these people and stuff. And God's basically saying, hey, there's coming a time when their iniquity is full. Go to Leviticus 18. When their iniquity is full and there's no more left, there's nowhere, it can't get any worse, basically. He says, that's when we're going to pounce. That is when I'm going to remove all of those people out of the land. And don't worry, I'm going somewhere with this. You'll see in a moment. Now, the Amorites, according to Genesis chapter 10, were Canaanites. Okay, They lived in that land, in the land of Canaan. So they are in that group. They are lumped in with those people. So what were some of the things that filled up the iniquity of the Amorites? Yeah, idolatry. Let's take a look at some more here. Look at verse 21, Leviticus 18, 21 says this, And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. Look at verse 22. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. So look, do you see those things today? Yeah, you do. How do people sacrifice to Molech today? Well, through the abortion clinics. People sacrifice their children to the God of convenience. And this goes on every day in this country. It goes on in this state here. It goes on in the world. It's a disgusting abomination to God. And you know verse 22 is going on today. That's, you know, what's going on is these things are being pushed to be normal, right? The government and religions today, like the Catholic Church, they're pushing these things as acceptable. Even your new evangelicals, guys, they are saying, hey, it's not as bad. You know, we don't want to go down there. We don't want to preach against that because what if somebody's had one in here? And sometimes people get put in a jam and, you know, an abortion could be necessary. They're endorsing it. And it's going to get worse. You already know this faggotry in verse 22 is being pushed everywhere. Look at verse 23. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down thereto. It is confusion. This stuff's going on. It's going to get worse in this country. Okay, and keep in mind, these are the things that the Canaanites did. These are the things that were filling the cup, if you will, of iniquity for the Amorites, for the Canaanites. Look at verse 24. Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things, for in all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. Look at verse 25. And the land is defiled. So not only, you know, people say, you know, to each his own, right? Whatever somebody does in, in regards to these types of sins, just let them do it. It's not hurting you. No, it hurts the land. It hurts the earth itself, and the land is defiled. Verse 25, therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. Look, 
The stuff that these freaks do, that they push, is so disgusting and so vile that the earth itself is disgusted by it. Go to Luke chapter number 11. So, God is giving these statutes and giving this information to the children of Israel so that they would not do the same things, so that they would not fill their cup with iniquity. Because what happened when the Amorites, or I'm sorry, the iniquity of the Amorites and the Canaanites was full? God displaced them. God used the nation of Israel to conquer them and to destroy those people and to remove them from the land. Well, what did Jesus say, for example, about the meek? He said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So when the iniquity of the world is full and the Antichrist is revealed and that whole situation happens, what's going to happen after God's wrath, three and a half years later, after God pours out his wrath on this earth? We're going to inherit the earth. It's the same exact thing. And so the mystery of iniquity also encompasses all this immoral stuff being pushed as normal and acceptable on society. So Luke chapter number 11, look at verse 29. It says this, And when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, This is an evil generation, right? And he's going to tell you why he's saying this here. Look after the, the colon. They seek a sign, and there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of Jonas the prophet. Okay? So even while Jesus is preaching and he's teaching, doing miracles, and doing all of these things, what do some of the people come up to him and say? Show us a sign. Right? We want to see a sign. What does he say about people that seek a sign and a wonder? They're wicked. Look at verse 30. And he says, hey, for as Jonas was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. Now, go to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. So again, you say, what is the mystery of iniquity? What is going on with that? What is the agenda? Well, I think it's very clear that it's a push to get people to seek signs and wonders, signs and wonders, miracles. Take the focus off the written word of God and put it onto miracles, put it onto signs, put it onto casting out devils, calling fire down from heaven. Well, let's take a look at something here. Second Thessalonians, we just read the chapter before the service, but look at verse nine. Even him, who's that? Yep, that's the Antichrist. Even him who's coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Now, is that talking about wonders that are lying down on the ground, taking a nap? No, no, these are lying as in to tell a lie, not true, okay? Deception, deceit, these types of things. Go to Matthew chapter 24. We're getting close to being done. Matthew chapter number 24. That is what is going on here. Satan is working and trying to prepare the earth to accept signs and wonders. Exactly what Jesus said was a wicked thing to look for. Matthew 24, look at verse number 24. So Jesus says this, talking about end times uh, prophecy. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and what are they going to do? And shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So if you're elect, if you're saved, if you're born again, if you are in that mystery of godliness, you're not going to be deceived by these things. And the reason why we need to understand this is because the mystery of iniquity seeks to destroy the mystery of godliness. Okay. Very, very simple. And what, what are we talking about here, Matthew 24? We're talking about the time of the Antichrist, right? He's saying, hey, there's going to come these false Christs, these false prophets. Now, look, when I look at Kenneth Copeland, when you guys look at Kenneth Copeland or Todd White or, or any of these fools, we're like, you're a joke. There's all kinds of videos out there about them, you know, putting their hand on someone in a wheelchair. The guy falls back and can't get up and they got to call an ambulance. Those videos are out there, right? But apparently it's going to get worse. They're going to get trickier. Somehow, you know, they're going to get something dialed in and they're going to make it to where people are going to be like, no, no, they're not playing games anymore. 
And isn't it kind of funny? Every generation, there's like a new charismatic Pentecostal type leader that's coming up. And what are they teaching? Work salvation, signs and wonders, right? And they use the Bible. They profess in his name, but they teach falsely. They teach you to look away from this word here, from the word of God. Go to, um, go to 1 John chapter number 4. 1 John chapter number 4. And while you're turning, I'm going to read for you. 1 John 2.18, John says this. We'll look at this this Sunday, but he says, Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. You're in 1 John 4. 1 John, 1 John chapter 4, look at verse 3. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And, you know, I heard somebody ask, or say this day, not too long ago, and they're like, but, you know, there's only a few people out there, right, that, that, that would say something like this. Well, no, what did we read in 1 Timothy chapter 3 about the mystery of godliness? Jesus is fully man and fully God. So people twist that subtly, right, and they fit into this category. So he, John is saying, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. So when people are teaching, you know, that, well, Jesus is just the human part. And after he was resurrected, oh, that's, that's the God part. Or people who deny the Trinity. Okay, they fit this category here. They are not of God. They are not saved. You were given that discernment. You were given that discernment so that you could judge other people whether or not they are saved. He says this, And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come and even now already is in the world. Last place I'm going to have you turn, Revelation chapter 13. And again, we've said this before. If it was alive and well in John's day, it's alive and well and thriving in our day. Because you can see this whole signs and wonders movement is going to gain momentum. It's going to get more powerful. You know, if you look into a lot of these other religions, like the Mormons, uh, the Catholics, they all agree with signs and wonders. Oh, yeah, you just ask them, you know, do you believe it's possible to just randomly speak in tongues and have a heavenly prayer? Like, oh, yeah, we believe that. Don't believe me? Next time you guys run into a Mormon out here, which will be tomorrow, just ask them and they will tell you. They will tell you that's what they believe. Islam, same thing. They have people that speak in tongues and who are they looking to? Well, they're looking for a savior too. They're looking for their God to come back. Revelation 13, look at verse number three says this, And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. Look at verse number four. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him? Now, what's going on here? Look at verse 12. Jump down to verse number 12. For sake of time, we got to skip to 12. He says this, And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. Look at verse 13. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. So after the Antichrist has his deadly wound, okay, he dies, the, the, the person, he's going to die, go to hell, and then obviously the devil's going to come in and possess this guy, or a spirit's going to come in and possess this guy, and he is going to rise and basically tell the world, I am God. That's what he's going to do. And he's going to say, this is a sign. And then he's going to do all of these other things. And he's going to be doing this to a world that has been primed and conditioned to seek after a sign. Look, most people today that claim the name of Christ, they won't even say anything bad about doctrines um, from Mormons, J-dubs, um, Catholics. They won't call anybody out anymore. Yeah. 
And if you don't believe me, just go look up any new evangelical. Go look up Stephen Furtick. If you could stomach it, just watch a few minutes of the sermon. Just, just play it on, you know, super speed and just kind of search the channel there if you've got the, the time and the guts to do it. And you know what you're not going to hear? You're not going to hear any warnings. You're not going to hear these things being taught. And it's not just him. It's all of his kindred. It's that type. Why? Because they are teaching people to look for signs and wonders. They are separating Christ from the Word of God. Once they have done that, once they have got you to look to them for their teaching and for their authority and, and all of these types of things, then guess what? They've got you. They've got the world. So when Islam says, oh yeah, he rose from the dead, I guess, you know, that makes sense now. We all do worship the same God. We worship the same God that the Jews worship. We worship the same God that the Hindus worship. We worship the same, you know, and it's just going to keep going on like that. And we can finally have peace and a one big happy family. But it's a lie. And those people in the great white throne judgment, very shortly after this happens here, will say, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils. And in thy name have done many wonderful works. What's Jesus going to say? Depart from me. I never knew you. I never knew you. Ye that work iniquity. I lied. Go back to Jude. One book before Revelation. One verse and we're done. So again, the mystery of iniquity seeks to destroy the mystery of the fellowship of godliness. So if this mystery can get people away from the Bible, away from the Word of God, well, they're never going to get saved. And if people do get saved, what is that mystery trying to do? What is Satan trying to do to people who are saved? to still get them away from the Word of God so they can't be dangerous, so that they can't go out there and influence other people and help people out and get them saved and teach them doctrine and to get them on fire for the Lord. That's the mystery of iniquity. It's deep. It goes much deeper than what I've covered tonight. But here's what we need to realize and do. Jude verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints, not once and then again and again and again, one time, one washing and you're done. One time you get saved, you're done. You get born again, you're positioned in Christ. That is the mystery that we are a part of. But you know what? We need to contend for the faith. These types of sermons need to be preached often because we need to know what's going on in our day and age so that we can relay the message to other people and to get them out of the snare of the devil. That's the goal. That's the idea. And so you say, what do we do about all this? Well, we do what we've been doing. We go out and we preach the gospel to the lost. Amen. You share sermons. You, 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 get, you do what you can to get the truth out into the community. That's what you do. And you don't back down and you don't let people deceive you. When something's taught, you go right here to this book. Amen. Because the other way is just, oh, just believe everything you hear. You know, you don't know if I'm lying to you. I've said stuff up here and I've been wrong. <laughs> I've come back like, why did I say that? You know what I mean? It happens. I'm human. We're human. And the only thing that keeps us going, the only thing that keeps that fellowship alive, that washing of the feet, that, that, that daily cleansing is this book here, which is the word of God. That's where it's at. That's why it has to always come back to that. So when people say, oh, another message about the Bible, blah, blah, blah. You know what? You got to correct them. Sounds like you, sir, have a problem. And we can't let that happen. And we need to be out there because, look, these Pentecostals, I mean, we were watching them go door to door on Saturday, and they knew what they were doing. They're out there making converts to their false religion, telling people that they have to turn from their sins to be saved. So we're out there trying to soul warn and to soul win, and they're out there soul losing. They're out there literally telling people, you need to work. You've got to turn your life around. And you need to come to our Bible study, and we will show you the full gospel where signs and wonders and all these miracles happen. Look, it's going to get worse. It's going to increase. And we need to be careful, and we need to be aware of that. And we need to contend with these people because it's only going to get worse. How is it that the majority of the world is going to look to the beast and say, yep, that's it. Look at all these signs and wonders because they're being conditioned to it right now. And we can stop that. Well, we can't stop it, but you know, we can at least pull some people out of the fire. Amen. We can at least leave our footprint here 
and be washed by the water of the word. And that's what we're going to do. Just keep doing what we've been doing. So let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Thank you so much, Lord, again, for revealing to us the truths about the coming apostasy and the things that are going on in the end times, Lord. And I just pray that you would use us to continue to contend for the truth out in the community, Lord, and to, to make disciples and to straighten people out. And we just pray that you'd be with us as we go out tomorrow and be with us as we fellowship, Lord, after the service. And thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.